Loving God, open our eyes to see you. Open our ears to hear you. Open your word to us and set our hearts on fire for you. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. The novelist, John Updike, was once asked, what is your favorite gospel? Without a second's hesitation, Updike said, the gospel of Luke. Luke tells the best stories. Then he thought for a second, and he said, well, yes, Luke is my favorite gospel, but I trust most the gospel of Mark. Mark was an early gospel and the least prone to wishful thinking. Well, all the gospels include the tragic execution of the protagonist, Jesus, so it's hard to accuse any of them of wishful thinking. But I think I know what Updike was getting at. If you take a closer look at the gospel of Mark, it has a kind of rough-hewn edge to it and honesty about it. Mark, you know, was a disciple of Peter. So uh, a number of church fathers affirm that his gospel is an example of Peter's preaching. There's a refusal in Mark to tie up loose ends. Mark has been described as primitive and unpolished. There's also a breathless quality about Mark. His favorite word is immediately. In Mark... Jesus is up against the powers that be, and you get the feeling that it's a real struggle for Jesus to be in this fight. I mean, he goes to his hometown, and he can do no mighty work. He's astonished at their unbelief. In Mark, it takes great effort for Jesus to do a miracle. It's, it's almost as if Jesus is engaged in an arm wrestling struggle with the demonic powers. There were no Christmas stories to snuggle up to in Mark. And even more surprising, there were no post-resurrection scenes, at least in the shorter ending of Mark, which scholars believe end at uh, chapter 16, verse 8. At the end of Mark, you know something has changed, that Jesus has been risen from the dead and the world is different, but you don't yet know how. That's what I think Updike was getting at when he said Mark was the least prone to wishful thinking. So let's look again at Mark chapter 1. Tom Long says it's very important to pay attention to the opening line of this gospel. And here it is. This is the beginning of the good news about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And now we know the whole story of Mark. The whole gospel is an exegesis. It's an explanation, an interpretation of that opening line. You know, it starts with the words, the beginning, which has at least three different meanings. The first is the obvious literary one, right? It's, this is the beginning of the story of Jesus as told in Mark. This is chapter one. The second meaning is more theologically subtle. You know, the Greek text does not have an article. It doesn't say the beginning. It just says beginning. The Greek word is arche. If if that sounds a little familiar, it's because we get the English word archaeology from that word. It means genesis. This is the new creation. This is the way the Christian life begins. It begins with baptism, and it's followed by testing and wilderness. It's up against the powers that be. That's how the Christian life begins. But according to Long, there's a third meaning, a very Markian meaning. This is not simply chapter one of the story, and it's not just the theological story of the new creation, But this is the beginning, but not the totality of the gospel. This is the way the gospel begins, but not necessarily 
the way the gospel ends. And in that sense, Mark is not simply the story of Jesus. It's the story of all Christians who attempt to follow in the way. This is the way the Christian life begins. This is the beginning of the good news about Jesus, who is two things. Notice the two titles of Jesus in that sentence. It says, in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, right? Now, Christ is not Jesus' last name, right? That's not his family name. Christ is his title, and it means Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah, and he is the Son of God. So I was at a conference once and I saw my preaching professor, Tom Long, do uh, an exercise and I've always wanted to try it myself. So we're going to try it here today. Um, Let's let this half of the sanctuary be Messiah and this half be Son of God. Okay, so when I point at you, you say? Messiah. And? Son of God. All right. So this is the good news about Jesus who is? And now the term Messiah is a powerful and strong term. This is the military Davidic hero who is going to restore the fortunes of Israel. And I've got some good news. It's good news about Jesus who is Messiah. The Son of God comes from a different symbol system in the Old Testament. Son of God is connected to the suffering servant songs. This is the identity of Jesus whose way will be the cross and suffering. He will bear our grief and sorrows. And I've got some good news. This is the good news about Jesus who is... And here is the secret of the gospel of Mark. It's right here at the beginning. Here's the secret. That Jesus is both Messiah and Son of God. All right, well, you can pat yourself on the back. You now know the secret to the gospel of Mark. And you know it in the first verse of the gospel. It takes eight chapters before anyone else finds out. Oh, I mean, a few demons know, but it's, it's just you and the demons. And people will ask intriguing questions like, who is this who can even forgive sins? And you pat yourself on the back and say, come on, that's Jesus, who's Messiah and who is this who can command even the wind and the waves? Well, we know who that is. That's Jesus, who's Messiah and now notice that Mark has set up something that is very interesting. You know what the gospel is, but you don't get it yet. There's a difference in Mark between knowing the gospel and getting the gospel. And you think you've gotten it when you just know it. And so when we get to the eighth chapter and we are at Caesarea Philippi, and Jesus says to the disciples, who do people say that I am? And they say, well, some of them say you're John the Baptist. (laughs) Some of them say you're Elijah. Some say one of the prophets. Well, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you're the Messiah. But the other shoe doesn't drop. Peter does not get that the gospel implies the only way Jesus can be Messiah is if he takes the way of suffering, which is the Son of God. That's why when Jesus goes on to teach the disciples that he must suffer and die before being raised again, Peter rebukes him, and Jesus has to rebuke Peter back and say, get behind me, Satan. Jesus is the true Messiah because he knows He must undergo great suffering. This is made clear when we get to the 15th chapter of Mark and Jesus is hanging on the cross and the second shoe finally drops when a Roman soldier looks up at him and says, that is the Son of God. 
So with that as our context, let's take a closer look at the story of Zacchaeus. You know, I've often wondered, why did someone like Zacchaeus risk his own safety to see Jesus? And I'd like to make the case that the secret of Mark's gospel can help us understand Zacchaeus' motivation. While Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, he stops in the city of Jericho before going on to Bethany, where he, he will raise Lazarus from the dead, and finally entering Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. So this encounter with Zacchaeus takes place just a few days before Palm Sunday. Verse 2 tells us Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector and rich. That is a loaded sentence. We meet many tax collectors in the Bible, but the term chief tax collector appears nowhere else. The Greek is a combination of two words. Uh, the first is arche, which we heard before in Mark. That's the word we've, um, that, that means beginning or first. So he was the chief, the leader of the publicans. And telones, which means a collector of taxes. That Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector and rich implicates him even more deeply in the corrupt tax system of the Roman government than your average tax collector. In a corrupt system, the loftier one's position, the greater one's complicity in that system. So before we go on, I want to make a, a side note about Zacchaeus. Uh, earlier in the service, we heard our kids do a terrific job singing the Zacchaeus song. You know, I love that song. I actually never had heard that second verse. I like that second verse too. But I used to sing that song with my kids when they were young. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. The song states that Zacchaeus couldn't see Jesus because he was too short to see over the crowd. However, uh, let's take a closer look at this sentence. Um, verse 3 of Luke 19. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was short in stature. Stat, uh, stature. Now, when you look at that sentence, in both the Greek and the Hebrew, it's actually not very clear who the short one was. Was it Zacchaeus or was it Jesus? Maybe Zacchaeus couldn't see Jesus in the crowds because Jesus was a short one, not Zacchaeus. We just don't know. Now, I do think it's likely, given the context, it was probably Zacchaeus who was the wee short one. But I just wanted to point out that that is not the only possible interpretation of this verse. And my, my wife, who is just five foot three inches, enjoys at least wondering about a shorter Jesus. All right, that was, let's get back to our text. Um, it's interesting that Luke mentions what kind of tree Zacchaeus climbed in verse 4. Uh, the sycamore tree is a large, leafy tree. So maybe Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus, but not be seen by him or the crowd. But Jesus does see him in the tree. And surprisingly, Zacchaeus is named by Jesus. How has Jesus, so close to death, got time to play games with someone like Zacchaeus? One commentator thinks that Zacchaeus climbs the tree to see Jesus because the crowd is trying to keep him from seeing Jesus. They hate him. And once up in the tree, a tactical blunder, the people are egging Jesus to give him a prophetic scolding, something like they might expect from John the Baptist, a courageous stomping of the chief tax collector. But Jesus doesn't like the setup, and to Zacchaeus' complete amazement, treats him like a long-lost friend, instead of giving him the pious scolding the crowd is expecting. And all who saw this began to grumble. Why? Why were they so upset? What's going on that they were so angry with Jesus? And notice, they all grumbled. That means the disciples, too. Why were the disciples upset? The Pharisees, the disciples, the townspeople, what expectations did they have that Jesus dashed? Well, it's helpful to remember what kind of profession Zacchaeus had chosen for his life. 
tax collecting under Roman rule was a corrupt practice. The Romans were very smart and they were very ruthless. They would allow people that they had conquered to survive, be economically viable, and then they would tax them. They chose people from the general population who knew where the wealth was hiding to collect taxes, and then they protected these collectors with Roman soldiers. And tax collectors also accepted bribes from the people. So you can see how they were hated by their own people and were considered to be traitors. Tax gatherers were despised as ruthless bill collectors for a corrupt government. Even the Talmud, which is a compilation of ancient Jewish writings, looked down on them, allowing a Jew the sanction of lying to a murderer, to a thief, and to a tax collector. The people who witnessed the encounter between Jesus and Zacchaeus felt oppressed by the Romans. And most of them were anxiously awaiting the Messiah, someone like King David, who would free Israel from oppression. And many were hoping that Jesus would be this Messiah. They yearned for a Messiah who would conquer evil, who would take someone like Zacchaeus, someone that everyone despised and so, who so obviously was their evil enemy, and destroy him. But instead of destroying Zacchaeus, Jesus restored him as a son of Abraham. No wonder they all grumbled. As a result of this action, Zacchaeus gains ground while Jesus loses ground. And so already we can see the shadow of the cross hovering over this incident. And I love how Zacchaeus responds. His response shows true repentance because repentance is when we do something to change, turn our lives around. In the laws of Leviticus and Numbers, voluntary restitution called for a return of the original amount plus 20%. It's pretty generous. But Zacchaeus goes way beyond the law's requirement for restitution, and he gives back four times to anyone he has defrauded, as well as half of his possessions to the poor. Repentance is not solely a transaction of the heart. Repentance also bears fruit. When a person has experienced God's love, they tend to become more generous, like Zacchaeus became. We, we loosen up. We learn how to forgive, uh, to ask for forgiveness, to be generous. Jesus sees Zacchaeus' repentance and restores his identity as a son of Abraham. I love the way Frederick Buechner puts it. Today, salvation has come to this house, Jesus said, and since salvation was his specialty after all, you assume he was right. And then Jesus concludes this passage with a messianic sentence. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. Jesus is pointing toward what will happen during the Holy Week. And, and um, verse 10 makes it clear, Jesus' visit in Zacchaeus' house it was not a delay or a detour on his way to Jerusalem. This was and is the very purpose of his journey. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus had set his face towards Jerusalem for this very reason. The story of Zacchaeus reminds me of the encounter of Jesus and the rich ruler that, that Rich Stearns referred to last week in his sermon. After the ruler goes away sad when Jesus tells him that he should sell all that he had and then follow him, Jesus said, how hard it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Well, look closely. Witness the miracle. A camel named Zacchaeus passing through the eye of a needle right in front of this crowd. It wasn't easy, but God made it possible. I mean, how can anyone be saved? Only through God. For nothing is impossible with God. Only God can save whatever one's condition. 
And so we get back to the question of why Zacchaeus sought Jesus out in the first place. Well, here's my theory. I believe it's because Zacchaeus saw the transformation and changed life of Levi, otherwise known as Matthew the Apostle, the tax collector at Capernaum. Remember, Zacchaeus is the chief tax collector, so he would be the one who oversees the, all the other tax collectors. So he would have known about the change in Matthew's life because of Jesus. In fact, Matthew, Mark, and Luke's Gospels all tell us that after Jesus calls Matthew to follow him, Matthew throws this big dinner at his house where there was a large crowd of tax collectors and sinners. I wonder if Zacchaeus was in that crowd at Matthew's home. I would not be at all surprised. What caused the transformation in the lives of Matthew and Zacchaeus? I believe it was the realization that Jesus was both the Messiah and the Son of God. Tax collectors knew full well the implications of the Messiah coming back. Right? The oppressive Roman system, which included their livelihoods, would be eliminated. They were reminded of that hope all the time by their fellow Jews. But the Messiah, who is also the Son of God, the suffering servant who sacrifices himself for the people he loves, who is a friend of tax collectors and who ate and drank with them and stayed in their homes, that would certainly be attractive to them, wouldn't it? I'm reminded of a quote by Madeleine Lengel. We do not draw people to Christ by loudly discrediting what they believe, by telling them how wrong they are and how right we are, but by showing them a light that is so lovely that they want with all their hearts to know the source of it. Zacchaeus saw that light and he was drawn to Jesus. He knew deep in his heart that he needed the Messiah for God is a God of justice and will eventually make things right. But for him to come to Jesus, he also needed an encounter with the Son of God, the one who offers grace and forgiveness. We need to be sure we don't only get half the equation, the Messiah piece, but not the Son of God piece, or vice versa. Jesus became Messiah, Messiah by walking the way of the Son of God. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are both Messiah and Son of God. We thank you, Lord, that your light is so lovely that we want with all our hearts to follow it, to know the source of it. Lord, be with us and bless us now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.